Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for taking the time to attend this presentation on physical activity medicine for individuals on the autism spectrum. So today I'm going to talk about autism and the impact of the symptoms on everyday life at home, in school, and in the community. Then I'm going to be talking about benefits of prescriptive physical activity on these symptoms and then factors to keep in mind to ensure that we are actually going to get the therapeutic benefits. And uh, last but not the least, we're going to be talking about autism-friendly tips to increase physical activity in children on the spectrum. So first, I'd like to dedicate this to Dr. Chainani. He was my mentor and the rehab director at All India Institute for Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation when I was a student there and staff. He was instrumental in steering me towards pediatrics when I was so sure that it was not meant for me. And I now know that it's definitely my passion. I would also like to thank Autism Connect for helping me connect with so many people literally all over the world in spreading the awareness of this particular topic. Autism spectrum is a comparatively young disorder. In fact, when I was uh, doing my advanced masters at NYU about 25 years ago, Autism did not even make the diagnosis of, um, you know, one of the diagnoses in which uh, when I was work studying there for developmental disabilities. So it's comparatively new. We've made a lot of advances, but we still have to get a better understanding of the brain basis of the disorder. There is no cure as yet, but the next, you know, the next best thing is to understand from the neurobiological um, underpinnings of the symptoms and then base and design interventions based on those symptoms. So, so there are many, many interventions and it is really overwhelming for parents to choose and see which are the ones that are effective for their children. And I'm really glad to say that exercise has made the list of evidence-based interventions. And, um, you know, I really want to scream it out from the rooftops because it's something that every parent will be able to do. So um, let me go and start off with talking about, um, you know, what is an evidence-based intervention? It is made of three components. It's the best available evidence that's available to the therapist. But since it was so new when I had started, we really did not have too much evidence and I had to base it on my clinical knowledge and skills. So the three components is best available evidence, clinical knowledge and skills, and the patient's wants and needs. So since um, there was no evidence initially, I used my clinical judgment and sought information from other fields like neuroscience, applied behavior analysis, play therapy, occupational therapy, speech, and education. And, um, you know, I, re I realized because I did whatever I had gained from all these different fields, I applied it and I had the opportunity because I was working for a very long time in New Jersey public schools. And I had the opportunity to actually implement whatever I'm going to be talking about today. And I'll be sharing all those instances with you. So. I initially started off by you know, coming up with these strategies, and now there is evidence to prove that it is an evidence-based strategy. So it's very, very exciting for me. And the most beautiful part about it is, you know, parents don't have to spend too much money. They can, if they want, they can do this at home itself. It does not need too much money, but it definitely needs time. Um, that you would spend and the investment that you would do in learning how to teach these skills to your child. And, um, you know, the reason why I say that is because when I started working with children on the spectrum, I realized that I had to reinvent myself. And the reason I say that is because I had taken so many things for granted. When I worked with children with physical disabilities, you know, things like they would respond to their name. If I told them come here, they would understand. If I told them sit or stand or you know, basic safety measures like don't do that, they would understand all that. But with children on the spectrum, no, they don't understand any of those things. And I want to just give a little feedback on, I work primarily with children from three years to 10 years um, on the spectrum. And I have seen 
kids up to 21, but um, not so much. There are not that many in my caseload. So when I talk, just understand that it is primarily for children between three and 10, um, but this is applicable for everybody. So, um, just hold on for a second. I don't know why this is not working. So with my experience, I just want to say, how did I start working um, with children on the spectrum? Because when I first went to the school environment, there was, you know, I didn't think there was a need for me to, or I didn't have a role to play when uh, working with children on the spectrum, only because they could walk and even run. Maybe they did it a little bit clumsily, but they could do that. So I never thought there was a need for me to be doing anything there. But I soon realized that they were not playing functionally. And that's how I got interested. And I you know, went towards all those other fields to find out what I could do for them. And the first time I remember uh, what I had done was I was in the autistic classroom and the teacher was trying, you know, she, it was circle time and she had the kids pressing down on uh, different vibratory toys. And one of the children, he was, you know, three years old and he was just crying and crying so much. He did not want to do that. And he was scared. It looked very obvious to me that he was scared. And she comes from a behavior perspective. So she was like, no, I'm not going to give in the, to this. He needs to understand that he has to do it. And I looked at her and I said, do you mind? Can I just take him? And she's like, sure, take him. And I want, I asked her whether I could take the toy. And she said, sure. So I took him to the therapy room. I did what I call my neurologically prepping activities. And I you know, asked him to touch the toy. And he did it with a smile. So I said, OK, let me take him back to the teacher. And um, I took him back. And I, you know, her class was nice and quiet. And I told her, OK, now you can ask him to touch the toy. And she was like, no way, Bala, I'm not going to do it. You know, we can't go through that again now. And I was like, no, trust me, just tell him to do it. And he pressed down on the toy. He looked at her and he gave her a very angelic smile. And she was like, how long is this going to last? And I said, that's exactly my point. It's not going to last for too long. I want you to tell me how long it's going to last. So keep checking him every hour and see whether how he responds. And when I met with her the next day, she said, Bala, you were right. It disappeared after three hours. And so she's like, what does this mean? I said, what it means is you all have to do the things that I do in therapy. Of course, not at the same extent. I can make it classroom friendly. And we need to rope in his parents because his parents would have to do it. He needs to have an opportunity to experience those sensations you know, many, many, many times for him to not be scared of pushing down on that vibratory toy. So she was sold on it. And, um, you know, obviously it was very obvious that we needed a team effort to do something like that. And then I had another parent who, um, you know, was using different, you know, there, as I said, there are so many different interventions. And she came to me and she spoke about the listening program and she was like, it doesn't work for my child at all. But when I went over how she was doing it, I realized that she wasn't doing it in the frequency that it was meant to be done. And once she started doing that, you know, he definitely benefited from it. So the reason I'm bringing that up is a lot of times parents and even teachers tell me, Bala, we do movement. Movement is part of it. In fact, movement is not even a problem. So, you know, it's not. It's, it's not such a big deal, but the takeaway message that I really want to give today is you may do the physical activities, but if you're not doing it in the right dosage and frequency, you are not going to get the therapeutic benefits that we would like to get. So, you know, that part of it is really very important too. So what is autism spectrum disorder? It is a developmental disability that can cause significant social communication and behavioral challenges. Physically, you know, when you see a child on the spectrum, it's not going to set him apart from his peers. But it is when, when they communicate, interact, and, and the way they behave, and they also learn in very different ways. It's different. Like, for example, the most glaring difference in their learning strategies is for most kids, when you're talking to them, that's an auditory learner, 
they they understand what you're saying but children on the spectrum they are visual learners which means that they need pictures and visual cues to learn and to understand what you're saying so they're thinking their problem solving abilities it's different so anybody who's interacting with children on the spectrum they really need to know all these signs and symptoms and the the other reason why i'm saying that is working in the school district i have had the opportunity to work with children from the time they were in preschool all the way up to high school and i have seen it's the only diagnosis where the functioning of a child is completely dependent on the adults who are interacting with him and um you know the re again this is because like in preschool a teacher could say i have no problems with this child he does so beautifully i don't have to give him all this extra attention and then he goes the next year to kindergarten and the teacher she doesn't want to follow you know or use the autism friendly tips in teaching him you know she's going to say that the child does not even belong in this classroom so and it goes on i have seen it how for some years the teachers say that you know it's such a pleasure having this child in my class and then you know there are some other years when they say that it's very very difficult having this child so it's completely dependent and why is it dependent because it depends on the person's expectations from the child and what i have found because kids on the spectrum look so similar to their typically developing peers people's expectations of what they're supposed to do is much higher than what they're really capable of and it's not that they are not doing things because they don't want to it's because the diagnosis the it it affects them in all those different ways and i'm going to go into that a little bit more so you understand what i'm saying so here are the symptoms now it is a spectrum disorder because each child each individual on the spectrum will present very very differently the, depending on what parts of the brain is affected they um will show different symptoms and so you can have there are no two kids who are similar you could have uh, one child being gifted and the other child could be very severely involved you could have one child who doesn't need any help with daily activities and you could have someone else who would for the rest of his life need someone to be there with, for just his daily activities but there are three things that are common in all individuals who are diagnosed with autism spectrum and that and that's the reason i'm sorry that's why it's called a spectrum because you could have some with just some symptoms and you could have some with all the symptoms possible so it's a spectrum disorder so the three things that is common in each and every individual who has autism spectrum is language impairment social deficits and repetitive behaviors so what does that mean language impairment if the child is very involved that that child will not be able to even communicate his most basic needs if he wants to go to the bathroom if he wants to rest you know he's not going to um he won't be able to do that he doesn't understand what's being said to him so like i said i had to reinvent myself when i was working with children on the spectrum because even telling them come here sit down stand they don't understand that if you physically do it for them it's a different thing but they don't understand it when you say it verbally so then then you could get children who can talk but then they have problems with their social deficits in the sense they don't understand body language they have a very flat effect they don't turn their head when you you know call out their name they like playing by themselves they don't like playing with other kids they don't you know so those are the social deficits that you would see and then what are the repetitive behaviors it is repetitive and very restricted so what that means is on a daily basis these children they need a schedule if you change anything they could have a meltdown like if they get up at nine o'clock and they have to go to school at that time and um you know you change it instead of nine you start getting them ready at 8 30 it could set them off if they get up late and then they go to school late that means you know the school activities have already started that could set them off so they're very very rigid in that they need a schedule and um the other things could be repetitive movements you know they could be just going forward and backward this way or they could go sideways they also have little like turning activities they could flick their hand like this 
that's like a visual stim and so it's you know it's very very rigid uh, i wanted to just say about the these the stimming type of activities that they have people who don't know about autism are going to keep telling them don't do it and actually that's the worst thing that you could tell them because in a way that's a way of them calming themselves and you're taking that away from them when you say don't do it don't do it don't do it so anyone working with children or interacting with children on the spectrum or individuals with the spectrum please don't tell them not to do it because they do it when they're stressed and you're giving them more stress when you're telling them don't do that they uh, so those are examples of repetitive behaviors the other thing also is they don't play functionally with toys and what i mean by that is like if you give them cars you know they are just going to like maybe line it up and not play where you know other children would say womb womb and you know play with it that way but they don't do that so it looks like it gives an impression that they are playing but they're not playing again from uh therapy point of view, I would also say like a lot of times parents will tell me, oh, yeah, my, my child plays with the ball. But when I see it, what I see is the child is like rolling on top of a big therapy ball. And what they're doing is they're still at sensory play. They're not using the ball to throw it or to bounce it or anything like that. But whatever sensory information they're getting from that, that's what they're doing. So those three things will be seen in all in different intensities in individuals on the spectrum. The other things that you would see is, which I see a lot um, because I see them more in the school is ADHD. So what is that? They have very poor attention span. They get distracted very easily. They are very hyperactive. And what, what is, how does that translate in the classroom? The way that translates is they can never sit like how I'm sitting when the teacher is talking to them. You know, they're always like sliding off or they're fidgeting. And if you think about it, you know, teachers are thought traditionally they want the student to not fidget, to give eye contact and to listen. But they can't do that. And I'm not going to go into reasons why they can't do it. I can just tell you that normally when we are sitting up, unconsciously we're getting messages to our brain that tells us that we are sitting upright but for children on the spectrum those messages are effective they are not getting those messages and the only way they can get that message is if they actually shift from side to side and that's how they know they are sitting upright but when we tell them don't fidget don't fidget don't fidget they have to consciously think about it and then they are not processing the information that you're getting and that's why it's so important that teachers know why they're doing it. They're not doing it because they're being, you know, bad behavior, but it's because it's not under their control. Then anxiety, I literally see anxiety in each and every child that I see, not just on the spectrum, any child with developmental disabilities, because, you know, they, people don't understand what their needs are, and especially children on the spectrum, the expectations is too much. So when people don't understand you, you could get really anxious. It could affect your self-esteem. So I see that all the time. In fact, every time I see a child, I first give them all the calming activities. You just need to calm them down first because when you're anxious and scared, you're not going to learn anything. So yes, anxiety is definitely a part of it. Then cognitive skills. It is their, their memory. I hear parents telling me all the time, you know, I taught him something and even teachers, I taught him something and then, you know, on that day he could recite it very well, he could do it very well. And then after two days, he can't do it. Or after a week, he can't do it. So short-term memory, working memory, problem solving skills, you know, all those things are also affected. Their ability to focus, concentrate, they get distracted too easily, all that comes under cognitive deficits. This gives you an idea of, you know, how challenging it is for teachers. And it adds up, and of course for parents, is because they also have irritability, you know, aggression and self-aggression. And I personally, I don't see irritability right from the beginning. I see it as the child grows because, and I see the irritability becomes a lot more when the adults in the child's life doesn't understand them. 
and when their expectations are too much. So personally, I have not come across irrit irritability that much from a very young age. It definitely is there later on. And uh, to compound it, they also have issues with sleep. And if they don't sleep well, then they're not going to have a good day. And they also have issues with eating, which is not mentioned over here. So, and then, of course, also seizures. So it is quite, quite a challenge in um, understanding and working with children on the spectrum. So what are the things that we usually see a lot? I just have another image on that for when they're walking, quite a few of them walk on their toes. And, you know, in school districts, they refer the children to me because the kid is walking on their toes, at least when we first started off. And walking on the toes is the least of their problems. But, you know, I was happy at least in this way, I was getting some referrals. Then the other thing which is really makes it difficult is everyone's go-to strategy when you want to comfort a child is to go give them a, you know, touch them, give them a hug, but they reject that. Uh, so it becomes very difficult in calming and consoling them. And the thing that's very concerning for parents is that they, are scared of things which they shouldn't be scared of and then not scared of things that they should be for example they don't understand the concept of safety so they could run you know into traffic they don't realize what's going to happen to them they don't understand stop and so that becomes a very big issue then um you know they're hyperactive i said about the sleep problems and everything and they like playing you know by themselves they don't like to play with others and um, what really comes in the way for parenting and for teachers is the mood changes and the hysterics and you know the meltdowns that they have. So it is really a challenge when you're working with children on the spectrum. You need to know what you have to do. And there is a strategy for all these things. I wanted to, again, just talk about, I want you to keep these in mind because exercise has an impact on all this, on the hyperactivity, on the impulsive behavior, the short attention span, sequencing, working memory, prioritizing, all these are the skill sets that teachers need. And if a child is typically developing, they come with all these skills ready by the time they're three years old. But this is not developed that, you know, it has not developed in children on the spectrum. So it makes it very, very, very difficult. And they also have very unusual reactions to things, you know, the way things smell or the taste and the look and the feel. An example of that is, you know, the fire bell, fire alarm um, in schools. It really can get them emotionally very, very upset. So again, that's another element for the teachers to deal with. And um, even, you know, parents find it so hard because they think they will take their kids for the fireworks. And then the child is screaming because he can't bear the sound. And, you know, that's another topic. There's a reason why all that is happening, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what the symptoms are. And since early intervention is the best, I've just put in this slide here, um, CDC has free elements and I mean free materials for families and providers if you're interested. I think they have something called the um, Milestone tra Tracker Mobile uh, app, which would be really good. It really helps parents track their children's milestones. And in case they have any problems and they have doubts, how to talk to your doctor about it. So it's a very good resource. I would encourage all of you to use that. So Traditionally, the focus of intervention was on the core manifestations, which is social skills and communication. So you had the speech therapist involved and you had, you know, if necessary, uh, behaviorists. But an ABA is all the way from the beginning. Um, and this is very, very, very important. But um, really nothing was done about those other skills that I was talking to you about, you know, in the classroom that the teacher really um, has a challenge with. So um, this is what made me wonder, and I would love for you guys to just ponder about this one point is ASD is a brain-based disorder and, it's and it has so many functions that are um, implicated when you have ASD and yet the students are referred for OT and PT primarily only for their you know, fine motor and gross motor challenges. It's like things to do with their muscles 
and their strength, muscle strength in the hands and legs, but they are usually not sent to us for school readiness skills. So I really want to, you know, I hope there are teachers and people and administrators from schools who are hearing me today to say that we are trained. We are trained in being able to help your staff and your teachers in overcoming or at least minimizing these issues. So what I forgot to mention is, you know, even though we've come such a long way, we still do not have a good understanding of the brain basis of ASD and there is no cure for it, at least not yet. And the next best thing would be to really look at the symptoms and come up with different types of interventions. So what does exercise really do? What is so fantastic about it? You know, a lot of people know the effect on the heart. It increases the heart rate. It makes the heart work pump harder. It makes it stronger. So cardiovascular um, endurance improves. The next thing is the effect on lungs. You're breathing hard. And um, so that improves oxygenation and the ability to fill the lungs with air. And so oxygen is basically delivered to all the cells in the body. And again, what I want to emphasize, which I did not, is I'm talking about when you're breathing hard. You get these effects only when you are putting your breath. It's like moderate to vigorous physical activity where you're breathing hard, but not that hard that you can't talk. So when you reach that stage, that's when you get all these benefits. And the last benefit is on the brain, which very few people know about. It's only a handful of people, um, at least in the therapy world and in the school world, because it is the one that I'm most interested in. And it has three functions. It improves neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, and neurochemistry. So what is that? Neurogenesis is the creation of new neurons. And um, so that's really very important. Neuroplasticity, it improves how existing neurons work. And neurochemistry is releasing neurotransmitters that improve brain function. So we do know that it is the way the brain is you know, communicating with the rest of um, the body. And for that, it needs um, the neurotransmitters to be balanced out and things like that. So since it has an effect on all three things, it is it has the capacity to affect almost all the symptoms that I had listed earlier. So in short, it improves function, attention, memory, reduces impulsive behaviors and social anxiety and improves mood and behavior. I mean, it is so powerful. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I just love it. So autism, uh, like I, what I didn't mention again is that people are aware of the effect on the heart and on the lungs, but they do not know that it has an effect specifically on autism specific um, impairments. And I just want to uh, say a quote by Dr. Reiti. He is an associate pro professor in Harvard Medical University. And he says, while most of us focus on exercise as a way to trim our waistlines, the better news is think of exercise as medication. Exercise turns on the attention system and executive functions like sequencing, working memory, prioritizing, inhibiting, and sustaining attention. I mean, this is so important. It is so important for teachers and parents to know this. So in other words, it causes kids to be less impulsive, which makes them more primed to learn. Now, remember I've spoken to you guys about, you know, what I had done in terms of going to the teacher and asking her, um, you know, to uh, I wanted to help out with the kid on the vibratory toy. So she spread the word around and um, the summer of that year, there was a new teacher and um, I just want to explain that the summer is an extended school year over here in the US and it's for five weeks. And, um, you know, I used to do, we don't do so much of individual therapies, you do group therapy. And I had done my group session with her class and she came to me after that and she said, um, you know, Bala, can you tell me what, what you're doing? And I was like, okay, what is she gonna tell me now? And, um, but then she said that I don't have to, you know, give them that much attention. They are doing much better after they come back from your group, but um, I can't 
you know, I want to learn from you and you tell me what you're doing because I want to see that effect every day. So, so if you teach me, I'll be able to do it every day because you only come once a week. And, um, you know, that was music to my ears. And she was so good. I really learned a lot from my teachers and everything. She said, well, we're going to make it. I'm going to come up with a rubric because I want to know exactly where it's helping them. So she helped me. And um, we, we looked at three things. We looked at the ability to follow directions, ability to stay on task, and the quality of work. And um, she had about eight students in her class. And you can see over here, that nearly everybody at the end of five weeks were doing better. There was only one student, that student C, who did not improve at all. And um, this is primarily because she was she joined the district on you know in, during that summertime, and she was totally new. So she was obviously very fearful, and uh, she was having a hard time with her transition. So this is just to you know, pinpoint and tell when somebody is scared, you will not be able to teach them anything. So what is the role of the PT then over here? It was, you know, the pilot study when the other teachers came to know about it. And when more importantly, when the administrators came to know about it, they then uh, invited me to give workshops on it. And it was really very, very helpful in spreading the word. and actually then they made it mandatory for the preschool teachers to include these activities and i'll never forget initially the preschool teachers who you know i'm very friendly with were actually quite mad with me and they were like bala we have so much to do and now we have to do you know what you tell us to do and you know i just smiled and i kept quiet because i just knew that they are going to see the benefits and then after three months they were coming to me and asking me and tell me, Bala, can you give us some more tips? And I was like, I'm curious, why do you want to know now? And they were like, Bala, you know, I, we know we gave you a hard time, but the kids are doing better. And if the kids are doing better, we are happy and we want to learn more. So increasing awareness amongst decision makers is so important. You know, we really need to go out of our comfort zones. And here I'm talking to physical therapists is, please go out of your comfort zone, make people aware of what the impact is of physical activity, and we can really, you know, do something for children on the spectrum and individuals on the spectrum. So what is the role? Is educating school administrators. And the other thing that we can do is, you know, we don't normally um, check beyond running and motor development takes place after that. The, development that takes place after walking and running is you know agility balance coordination and these are the things that children need to play with other kids and there are many reasons why they're not playing with them but one of them is also their motor impairments things like uh, you know when when they have to play green light red light uh, freeze doing jumping jacks playing hopscotch, all those things need advanced gross motor skills, but we are just not used to checking them. So physical therapists, please, you know, look at all their ways of locomotion and things like that. I remember when I was in the school district and um, I had already got a really good rapport with the administrators and the director of special services told me, she said, Bala, why do I care if the kids can skip or not? We have so many issues going on. And um, I, you know, again, for me, every time I don't want anyone to take my word, I always back it up with research. And there's a lot of research that says academic skills and motor skills go hand in hand. The brain uses the same neural networks when it's developing motor skills, at, same as academic skills. So that was one way. And the other thing is there is research that says that locomotion is connected with reading. And what is locomotion? Locomotion is the way you move from point A to point B. It could be walking, running, skipping, galloping, and most kids on the spectrum cannot skip. So working on skipping, you would see improvements in reading. And it has happened. I have done it. And I've had teachers telling me that there is an improvement. Then object manipulation skills, which is anything to do with like, you know, ball skills or with hula hoops or with scarves, or anything like that it is connected with math skills. So again, I have proven that, you know, working in school districts. So 
go ahead if anyone tells you why do, why do we need to teach these skills to the children this is the reason um another thing is i you know let the teachers know that you could be a resource for them we need to be a resource for them and um that's another thing and then providing parents with autism friendly tips to embed physical activities into their children's daily activities so what exactly does exercise do it increases the levels of a brain protein called bdnf and this you can think of as the brain's fertilizer it actually helps with the formation of brain cells so it is really very very important and um so that's one the second one is serotonin it is very good for motivation and willpower a lot of parents tell me my child is just not motivated or even the teachers tell me they're not motivated so you know this is another reason for them to want to incorporate physical activity nor epinephrine it is more for energy and concentration so to improve your child's concentration and attention to the task that they're doing you this is another reason dopamine is for pleasure and focus decision making and it's 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 a pleasure center you know it's a reward center so they feel good when they do things you these are the benefits of uh, implementing exercise um in a child's daily routine and the other very very good thing is it reduces the level of the stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline so you can see the benefits of it is just amazing okay and the other now the other thing is all exercises are not created equal so how do you choose if you want depending on what the symptom is you're going to say okay i'm going to incorporate this type of activity or this type of exercise and but i want to stress that the 30 minutes of vigorous moderate to vigorous activity is a must for every child on the spectrum that would give them the benefits of you know the heart the lungs and the brain they need that they need it to level the playing ground okay so that is a must for all children then if they still have problems with concentration and memory and anxiety and depression you would want to include these type of activities so if you want to increase concentration you may want to think of yoga tai chi and aerobics if you want to increase blood circulation it's cardio activities like dancing skipping jumping things like that memory you want to work on aerobics walking cycling those are the ones that would increase memory stress and anxiety is yoga and you can do it in a very child-friendly way it's only after coming here i'm a certified yoga teacher for children too and i realized like i always thought of it as being you know something very calm you have to have a lot of self-discipline but working with children i take the yoga concepts and i uh, you know use a lot of visual props like i use colorful ribbons and streamers and things like that and you know can entice children to do this one of the things that i found working in school districts is that children don't know how to uh, breathe efficiently actually a lot of adults who are typically who are typical also do not know and i'm going to tell you what i mean by that if all of you just take a nice deep breath in Put one hand on your belly and see if your belly is coming out or in. If you take a nice deep breath in, your belly should come out. And when you breathe out, it should go in. A lot of people will do just the opposite. And most kids with developmental disabilities will do the opposite. So they're not breathing efficiently. And if they're not breathing efficiently, the oxygen is not going to all the organs, which is so badly needed in them. And I talk later on when I talk about autism uh, friendly tips and organization type of activities, how you can do that. So that's a very important thing is teaching children how to breathe properly. And if your child has a lot of you know, depression and anxiety and things like that, again, aerobics and resistance training. So resistance training, if you can, with the younger kids do it, it's things like you know, pushing furniture, that's a lot of resistance. And so you're gonna do it in very safe ways. You've got to get very creative with it, but it can be done. And I also wanted to mention that treadmill, if anyone is using the treadmill, that is a very, very good way of 
doing activities, especially now with COVID and all that. And it has a lot of other benefits too, if you know how to use it. There's a program called the TAP program, which is very specific for children on the spectrum. And um, that's a good thing to know. So I look at uh, exercise as brain food. It is a brain-based disorder. So why not become very aware of what food it needs? So, and when you use it that way, you are using it like medicine because medicine needs to be taken daily. You can't just take it whenever you see the symptoms and whenever you want. The medicine, you know, could be, it is, we all know, would have treated the person if they had taken it, you know, at the right time, they're taking it daily and things like that. So if we start changing the way we look at exercise and we do it every day, we will be making a big change in children on the spectrum. And um, the other thing that I want to say is when we take medications, this is the other little bit that I want to tell, is that when we take medications, we are actually um, trying to give the body what it lacks. And uh, like, for example, in diabetes, you know, it's something to do with the um, production of insulin. So the medication that we give is, again, to do something to do with insulin. So the same way, when it's brain-based, it is the sensory, the sensations that they want and the motor activities that the brain wants. So look at it as food and medicine for children on the spectrum. So everyone, what I get from parents, like I had mentioned earlier, they're like, oh yeah, my kid does it. And if the kid does not um, do physical activities per se, but you know, is walking and running, the parents are, we, are, we do so much, you know, for the children because there are so many needs and we can't think about correcting what they say is we don't want to do we don't want to correct something that's not broken and um that's you know you don't have to think of it that way hopefully with the information that you have today you're going to change your mind and realize just how important exercise is so again the intensity is very important I do this a lot, you know, I have parents literally all over the world and they send their, the videos of their children doing physical activities. And the one thing that I have to keep repeating and telling my parents is we have to find something that will make them breathe hard. The breathing hard part of it is very, very important. The frequency again depends on, um, you know, how severe their symptoms are, but every day is for sure. Even if you're very, very, very mild symptoms, you need to do it every day. The duration, they say is 60 minutes, but there is research that says you can get these benefits with 20 to 30 minutes of physical activity every day too. I've just given this for parents, you know, to let them know what are the different activities that they could choose from. Every day is going to be something that they can do easily. You know, that's not the time to try and train them in some motor activities. So do things that they can do very, very easily. So it could be walking, going to their favorite places. You know, if they like jumping on the trampoline. You let them jump on the trampoline. Anything that's going to get their heart rate to increase. Uh, some children love dancing. And if the whole family does it together, you know, you all could, uh, breathe hard and pant together it'd be a great bonding experience too and then there are like the team sports and things like that that you could do three to five times or two to three times and then of course everyone knows that this is common sense is we want to cut down on screen time it doesn't i'm not going to say that you have to cut it down completely it has its place but if they're using up all their time in the day to look at you know screen time and do things only with their fingers and not doing physical activity, that's when it becomes a problem. So you want to really balance it out. Again, I'm gonna keep saying this all the time because I hear it, you know, I my parents keep telling me, yes, we get it, we get it, we get it. But when I look at the videos, I don't see them breathing hard. And it's like, we have to get them to breathe hard. And it's that's a journey, you know, it could take two years for some people. And for some, it may just take a month or so to get your child to breathe hard. So it is, it is a journey and it takes time, 
but since it takes time you don't want your child to give up on it so we have to try and make it fun as much as possible and build up on this slowly it is an investment of your time but the return on investment is so fantastic it is worth your efforts and um you know you're going to enjoy it it's more bonding time with your kid and with your family so it is a team effort it's definitely a team effort and i'm going to give you an example of that is when i uh, when I did not have the opportunity to collaborate with teachers and parents when I was in the public schools, you know, it was just me taking the kids to my little tiny room, doing whatever I had to do, and then take the kid back. I would see results, okay? I would see results, but it didn't last. It did not last at all. And um, actually, I take that back. I would see results but not any results that sustained for too long and if it had to sustain it took two three years so it was just taking too long and i was like i have to do something about this i have to tell teachers and i have to tell parents i have to tell everyone why we all need to work together so initially it was it was difficult it's not that teachers did not they all want they all want to do this but they don't have collaboration time penciled in so and this is an ongoing thing it's not like you go talk to the teacher one day and you're done for the whole year it literally is almost an everyday thing so the lines of communication needs to be open if even if i'm not physically there the teacher needs to know that she can communicate with me via email and if she has any blocks to whatever was recommended we can talk about it and so the way i started is i used to see if there were teachers who would are interested in doing classroom breaks and the ones who did it we saw better results so that was really beautiful and then the teachers would tell me which are the parents who would um you know be interested and when we had the teacher the parent and me all working together i am not even lying i literally came from not getting any results for two three years to a point where I have to keep calling the mother at the end of my therapy session to say, these are the changes, I'm changing this, I'm changing this, I'm changing this, meaning the child was getting better. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So it's really important. So I, the way I sell this is I tell parents, your responsibility is to make sure that they get the 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity five days a week. I mean, if you want to make it seven days, that's fantastic, but at least five days a week, or at least when they're going to school. Teachers, if they can have the movement breaks um, incorporated and, you know, the therapist and the teacher work for what works best, because each teacher is different. And it's really important that we take the teacher's likes and things like that into consideration. And, um, you know, we as therapists, we would um sort of educate the teachers to what movements need to be incorporated in those movement breaks um, to have an impact on the kids we are trying to target because nowadays with asd the incidence going up so high we have a lot of children as research also says is that they should be in regular ed classrooms and um so you know there's a move that we don't want to do things separately for the children who have these needs because it makes them different and they already feel so different. We don't want to give them another option to feel more different and to feel bad. So we use something called universal designs of instruction, you know, so that we're doing it for everybody. And the activities that we choose is good for all, but it is necessary for the children, you know, on the spectrum or the other kids with developmental disabilities. And then the physical therapist could work on motor skills and also be a resource to the teacher so once again the, it cannot be done by just the therapist in fact we are a very very small place to play over here it's a small but very important but if the parents and the teachers are not on board we're not going to see any results kids spend all their time at home and in school teachers and parents are very 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 important so what are just to give you a little bit of an idea of the classroom friendly movement breaks is you know i look at teacher preference like some teachers will say i like aerobic type of activities someone will say i like yoga type of activities everyone is shown how to do good breathing but depending on the child on the teacher's preference 
um, I tailored to that because I want her to be consistent, her or him. I want them to be consistent in the implementation. So give them um, activities like the vestibular proprioceptive visual activities that would help in, um, you know, I mean, during those movement breaks. So I did, you know, move out of physical therapy to find out if anybody else had done research between the connection between academic and motor skills. And um, I reached out and I got actually certified in Brain Gym. It is a wonderful resource if anyone is interested. Me Moves is something for teachers that they could have instead of always having the movement breaks. You know, it's a computer-based program that, you, that the children could follow and you could put it on whenever you want. Yoga, pranayams is breathing, uh, you know, lack of uh, another word, breathing exercises and dance. I mean, dance, I have seen, teachers use it and it is so effective it is so effective it's absolutely fantastic so like i said children like the visual cues so this is a poster of the different movements that children could do in the classroom so having that would be really nice is consistency important i'm sure all of y'all got that message that it's very important in fact we depend on it it's very important for sustainability and I can't stress upon it more. It would help if you think of exercise as medicine. It has to be taken every day. I just want to share with you that when I was in the school system, the ABA therapist, the Applied Behavior Analysis um, Therapist, she used to work in the corporate world. And um, But when she had her daughter and realized that her daughter was on the spectrum, she uh, you know, went to and got certified as an ABA therapist. And she was sharing with me at the time when she was talking to me, her child was in middle school. And she told me, she said, Bala, exercise, my walk, my walk with my daughter is the most important activity of the day. Because if I don't do it, she said, my day is spoiled. Her day is 100% spoiled, but my day is spoiled too. And I won't be able to do anything. I mean, she took it to the extent of not willing to stay for any meetings or anything. She had to leave at 2.30 because remember what I said, they are very rigid about their schedule. So when her daughter came back from school, you know, she ate a little bit, did whatever she had to do. And then after one half an hour, she went for her walk. And my colleague used to always work close to home, but the district where we were working was an hour away. And so when she got employed or she came in as a consultant, she had made all those things very clear. And exercise is that important. She used to get migraines and she said, Bala, even if I have a migraine, I'm 100% gonna do it because my migraine is only gonna get worse if I don't take her for that walk. So it is really, really, very important. So to review this, when it comes to autism, the obvious isn't so obvious. Like I said, it has a lot of effects on the brain. And just remember that persistence trumps perfection anytime. So you want it to be fun. You don't want perfection. That's the other thing. When I would check my, when my parents sent me their uh, videos, I saw they were always correcting their child, you know, correcting them. And, and then you could see the child would have started off happily and then had become so tired. So we don't want that. We don't want, when you're trying to do it for 30 minutes, you don't want perfection. Believe me, you don't want it. So take small steps. And, um, uh, you know, if you get your child to start moving more than they have already done what they are doing right now, then you've done a great job. So don't be hard on yourself. Don't try and get things done. Don't try and do too much and too fast. Take it nice and slow and enjoy it. And if you haven't tried exercise as yet, I literally promise you that it's worth the investment and the effort. So what are the autism friendly tips? Like I said, most of them are visual learners. So you want to show them pictures of what you want to do. Remember what I said, sometimes they don't, not sometimes, kids young, like three years and everything, they don't know what is expected out of them. They don't know what you want them to do. So using pictures is really very, very important. It provides them with a structure. It tells them, it gives them an idea of what's gonna happen next. So. There's something called visual schedules, and I'm going to show you pictures of that, which lets them know what is expected from them next. The other thing that children on the spectrum is they don't understand this concept of we do this first and then that. So teaching them that 
you know, when you have a visual schedule, is like you have one activity, then the next activity, you know, and you have the pictures there, it lets them understand that that's what you want them to do. So, um, you know, it's very, very important to use that. And it also helps them to decrease their frustration levels. So uh, we have to be organized. Remember what I said about how they um, really do well with schedules. So that is really very important. And um, sometimes parents tell me that they're just not interested. How can we get them motivated to do it? So there are something called social stories. You can read to them stories about fun physical activities. And, you know, of course, when, you, when I say read, it should have a lot of pictures. And um, you could make pictures of them doing different activities and then let them point to those things. Like if they are walking, they have a picture of them walking and then, you know, you can teach them that that's what a walk, a walk is. And having a timer is critically important. So I'm going to show you what that means. So this is what I meant, like, you know, you can get your child doing all these different activities uh, or get another sibling or you could do it, too. You know, as an adult, if your child is not doing it or walking, skipping, doing all these different playing all these different games. And um, if the child is older and, you know, if it is at their functional level, you want to teach them which are the strength training exercises, which are the cardio and which is the flexibility. So if you have a chart like this and you go over this every time you see them, it's really very good. This is, again, giving the components of fitness. So you can work with the PE, with the physical education teachers in school and, you know, go over these things and teach them all these different activities. So for kids who don't understand, you want to work, you first let them identify what um each picture stands for so they get a good understanding of that and then you have what we call the first and then boards so you have a picture over there of what the child has to do first and after he's done with that go to then and you can then go to first next and then now children don't know when an activity um finishes so you have to have a very clear way of indicating that the activity has finished um, before I get into that, if the child is a little bit more higher functioning, then you can give him so many different pictures over there and the, it's called a choice board. And they say like at break time, I choose to do these activities and it, you give them a choice. So they have a feel, a little bit of control and they can pick out all these different pictures because they're usually, you know, it's I know this is my phone, but you can it's like half of this and it has Velcro at the back and the other side of that is kept on these boards so they can pick it out and put it on these boards so they get to choose and the minute you know they get to choose it changes things they just a lot more cooperative this is another way i use this a lot i just put it on the board and i write down all the different activities that the child is going to do and the choice that i give them is i have you know boxes at the side of each of these activities and they can choose which one they want to do first it's such small little tips, but when we allow them to participate, it makes a huge difference. It's like almost I felt magical, you know, from going from a point where I didn't know what to do with them because they were just not listening and I didn't know how to get their attention. And then by incorporating all these things, it was a complete pleasure. Uh, so these are the timers that I'm talking about. It lets them know if they can see if you tell them do it for five minutes, you have to adjust it so it, you know, it rings or some auditory or some way that they know that the time is done. And it tells them, okay, now we have to go to the next activity. So when they hear it, they can go to the next activity. So using a timer is, it, 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 it's big difference. Um, then teaching them, they need to know, you know, that this activity is finished and we're going to the next one. So you could have something as simple as a clipboard, you know, have all those Velcro pieces, you have all your pictures and you have a to do list and a done. They feel so good when they can take the from the to do list and put it in the done list. It makes a difference. I had a parent doing, you know, she was she was finding it so difficult to get the child to go from one activity to the other. But the minute she incorporated this magic, I call it magic. It's such a small thing, but it's magic. Intrinsic motivation, you know, if they can see again, 
it's so important to have these visual props to-do list and the done list and they feel so happy when they have they put all these pictures on the done side it really works um i would also say you know the tips for directionality the activity skill the visual props all those things the rules on the wall i've already spoken about all that that really makes a very big difference and positive behavior supports is if you're having a problem with you know uh giving rewards to the student is go talk to the speech therapist they are they have beautiful ideas or talk to the aba therapist if your child has an aba therapist they will guide you on how you can give the positive behavior supports it's very very important so parents too you know make use of the resources that your children are getting in school and ask those specialists what can i do at home it's very very important talk to them about the problems that you have at home with your child and tell them, can you apply what you're doing? How can I apply it at home with my kid? So the message to parents is please start small. Don't try and do everything in one day. Fun is more important. Dance is a beautiful way of starting um, you know, this exercise. Walk whenever it's possible. You can do it like if you're like, watching TV together. Every time an ad comes, just stand up. And do, you know, just doing hand movements and everything too does work the heart more. That's another thing that I wanted to emphasize on because again, I had parents sending the videos and they're saying that they are moving quite a bit. They're doing it for half an hour, but you know, their heart rate is not going up. So to put more stress on the heart, you have to do a lot of arm movements. You can do a lot of different things, you know, get creative with it. But when you incorporate um, hand movements and you can get them to jump in place, you know, usually most kids like the jumping. When you do those two together, it makes a big difference. And you can get them to breathe hard. Uh, nowadays, you can't go out, so you can do the figure of eight walking at home. It basically means that you have two chairs at home, you know, place some distance away, not too close, and they make a figure of eight um, walking around them. So you can then tell them, use music, and, you know, you can make it fun by saying, run, stop, you know, or just say that, okay, we're going to run, we're going to walk, we're going to gallop. And the way you make it fun is by stopping and starting. So that's another really fun thing to do. Uh, climbing stairs, if you have access to stairs, and you can use a stationary bike, yoga, breathing exercises. You have so many things that you can do. So for therapists, I would say work smarter, not harder. I am trained in um, sensory strategies. But what I didn't realize is that if I pair it, you know, I would be working smarter, not harder. So uh, what I mean by that is I used to give them the vestibular activities and everything. But depending, again, on each child's needs, sometimes, most of the times, my kids were calmer and more organized when I send them back to the classroom. But sometimes they were more riled up. And I would always ask the teachers and say, you know, let me know, because then it tells me what I need to modify and do. And I learned that if I, you know, engage other sensory systems along, you know, at the same time, like I'm using tactile and vestibular and, you know, that's another course by itself. But I just wanted, wanted to say that if you work smarter, you will be able to send the kid back to class um, organized. You don't have to, um, you know, send them back and say that, oh, I wish I, I wish I had more time. There are strategies in working smarter and not harder. So these are just different books that could be used. It's all picture books to get your child moving. And pre-teaching is really very important. If your child is beyond that stage, then and they're not doing that well in you know, the gym class, in the physical education class, you want to coordinate with and collaborate with the PE teacher, ask them what the lesson plan is, and um, you know, talk to your child about it beforehand. And you're going to make it very familiar for them so that they don't get scared when they are in school in that noisy gym class and um, make them feel, you know, that feeling of success should be there. Or you could also ask the teacher or, you know, their child has an assistant, you know, that they would should go over all these tips with the student beforehand. For breathing, I put a lot of emphasis on breathing. So it's very difficult to teach this skill, by the way. It's very, very difficult. So be prepared for it, but it's worth it. You know, even if you have to do, take two years to do it, it's fine. But these are some of the fun activities that really help is like blowing bubbles. You can do that today at home. 
um, make it fun and if you want to make it a little bit more educational and you want to increase their body awareness you can say you know touch the bubbles with your head with your elbow and things like that so that could be a really fun activity blowing on a pinwheel is really also uh, helps with breathing and what is the best physical activity for children it has to be something that they like you know you don't want to be teaching them um, a motor skill leave that to the therapist it's very hard for a motor skill to emerge let the therapist do that you just do all the fun stuff so whatever the child can do easily that's what you want to do you want the child to do it every day so it has to be fun and you know i i saw some of the videos where the parents were lying down and they were telling the kids one two three i'm like no the child looked too bored you don't want to do it that way they need everyone to do it so they can have fun okay so you always want to think in terms of what can i do daily and i just had this i try to make it a little bit easy the acronym is times you know just to review the autism friendly tips t is for timetable and they need to see it they need to see it with the visual cues and everything so remember that or if you're giving them any instructions they need to know what it is use visual cues i is for ideas for this physical activity so you know you want to start with something familiar and then how do you make it more fun you change the timing you say let's run fast go slow stop turn jump you know all those sort of things you can add that into your you know for example if you're doing the figure of eight and different ways of moving you can tell them to go shift from side to side go forward and back and rotate those are the movements you want to incorporate and m is for meditate if your child of course if child is very young it may be difficult so if you can't do that then blowing the bubbles and breathing in something that they really like like one of my parents said her child loves smelling and inhaling whenever she cooks you know food that he likes so make use of that you know make them breathe that in so it, their body knows what it means to taking a deep breath exercise i've spoken about it a lot so i mean that's e and the environmental setup is you know having music and um you know with the younger children i used to just put lotion on their hands and give them a little bit of traction so that's what i call my neurologically prepping activities i find that to be very very useful and s is for sleep because if the child has not got sleep you know not, nothing is going to work so um that's a very important thing to talk to parents about and um, again, you know, I keep saying it all the time because when I do this with my parents, you know, the activities that they choose sometimes I'm like, oh my God, I can't, the children won't be able to do it. So yes, it has to be something that they like and they can do uh, easily. And um, I actually, that is, um, that is, um, you know what i wanted to um my presentation was all about if anyone has any questions i would love to take them i hope each and every one of you with this awareness of what physical activity does it all depends on you now what you do with that information it was a pleasure talking to all of you and thank you once again to autism connect for giving me this beautiful opportunity I will now look at the question. Nice to you. I'd like to know. I'd like to know how we can plan their movements needs in an inclusive school. Can you give us detailed idea? The detailed idea, you know, I won't be able to do it in the one-hour presentation, but I would, um, you know, that I could definitely do a one-day course because it is a lot of information on what activities how do you base it you have to do an assessment first to see what are the needs and then accordingly give the um, movements um then i have oh someone is saying no volume and has left okay uh, some other questions is um can you please list scales and outcome measures for symptoms in the spectrum therapy point of view. I uh, Can you please list skills and outcome measures? So um, for that information, you know, email me and I'll definitely get back to you on that. 
pain management in autism. That's one of the things that uh, is a symptom, you know, which I didn't get a chance to cover is for children who do have um, sensory issues, many of my kids don't actually perceive pain. And even when they fall, they don't um, perceive it. So you have a lot of problems in terms of them getting these bruises and things like that. But I've never had anyone who had a problem with pain management. So if you email me, you know, I would like to understand what exactly you mean by pain management. Why are they having this pain? Is it more the superficial touch that you're talking about? Then yes, I can definitely help you with that. Uh, please email me and I will answer those questions. Is there a clear demarcation between Asperger's and autism? It used to be before, but now with the DSM-5, um, it comes under autism spectrum. So there's no separate diagnosis as Asperger's anymore. Um, then um, I have a patient who has ASD and he is four years old. Um, He's taking speech therapy from almost a year and also other therapies like OT and PT. The difficulty is facing, I'm facing with him is he is looking for his shadow and laughing a lot and he enjoys doing this also. He is on medication for the same, but it is not reducing. What would you suggest for him? Everything that you heard today is beautiful for him. Please do it. I would love to hear from you. Oh, another thing that I want to say, since you said he was laughing a lot, one of the things is inappropriate laughing. You know, they don't have the communication skills. So I actually, we actually had an inexperienced therapist giving vestibular therapy, and it's a very powerful um form of therapy and if you don't understand it and you don't know when to stop you could actually create you could cause seizures from it and you could also like the things that I have seen I'm not really seeing seizures but I've seen children throwing up and um, uh, just not feeling good at all one of them actually was as she was as the kid was getting you know rotated on a swing he was laughing and laughing and um, then when it stopped he actually bit the therapist and she was very confused about it and i said you have to understand you need to distinguish between a hysterical laugh and a laugh which is you know because of joy so it's very important to understand what you need know, to understand the child and vestibular therapy you know you need to get trained really well in it and need to know when to stop so it is something that uh, should not be taken lightly, but vestibular therapy, I can swear by it. It has beautiful results. And the objective thing that I have used, you know, because first initially there was no uh, guidance for me as to what I can be doing with children on the spectrum. When I did my assessment, it was a sensory motor assessment. And, you know, which meant that I really uh, assessed the proprioceptive vestibular and all those other senses. And I use the post rotary nystagmus test, which is basically you rotate the child, you know, 12 times in one direction. And then um, you, when it stops, when you stop the rotation, the child has nystagmus. Okay. That's involuntary movement of the eyes and it should last for 10 seconds. And that means it's normal. The vestibular system is working as it should. And so when I used to do all my therapies, I always checked, you know, like at the end of the school year, I would check to see um, whether there was a difference to the vestibular response in the, we call it PRN. And um, I'm happy to share, yes, I definitely saw changes. And maybe I didn't see the change, it depended. If it was a team effort, then we would see it by the end of the school year and sometimes earlier. And when it wasn't a team effort, it took sometimes up to three years to see those, see those changes. Um, the next one is how do I help my child when he has a meltdown in the class? Well, all the things that I said today is definitely very applicable and we won't be able to help him only at that time. Um, with this strategy, it has to be, you know, if you do your part, you know, no one, I want parents real to understand that they don't have to feel frustrated that things are not being done for their child in school because one thing that I can tell you is anyone who works with children is doing it because they love children 
And um, if they're not doing it, it's because they don't understand what to do and how to do it. And you can do what parents can do is if they do the 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity, the teachers are going to see a change. There is no question of it. So this brings me uh, to the example of one particular child. He was in the autistic classroom. I think the kids were around uh, like it would be like third grade. And um, the teacher, you know, came to me and she said, Bala, I can't teach this child. You know, the mother gets him late every day. Whatever we tell her, she gets him late. And, um, you know, he the fact that he has to join class in the in the middle of the school day, not middle, but at least an hour later, um, he finds it very hard because remember what I said about schedules and routines. And she's like, he's just having a bad day. There is nothing, you know, there's nothing that I can teach this child because he is not in the zone, in the mode to learn. And so I said, it's okay. You know, I have one thing that I feel very happy to uh, share with you guys is I have a fantastic rapport with parents. So I, you know, I called for a meeting with the parent and I spoke to her. She had, of course, her own reasons as to why she was getting him late. But I explained to her and I told her, I said, if you can come to the school grounds, come half an hour early and let him run. Of course, I got all the permissions from everywhere where he could do this and let him run for 30 minutes. And he loved running, loved meaning loved running. And it was an enclosed place. So he did it for 30 minutes and he was on time. And then the teacher, you know, basically did all those movements that um, I recommend for them. She was an absolutely fantastic teacher. So she did that and I worked on, you know, during his therapy sessions on the movements and the results were great. You know, it was, again, I'm going to tell you, magical. Um, it really made a big difference. So that's my answer to you. Um, speech, this is by, um, you know, you'll have to forgive me. I'm looking at just the questions, but I didn't say the person who's asking. Um, there was someone else who said it was the same issue. I hope I answered that. Then Uma Parvati is saying speech therapy, children's, I don't understand what this Ilanti, I don't know what that question is. I'm sorry. Um, then Zareen Sheikh said, can you also chip in a note about tips with sensory diet? Um, that's a topic by itself. Um, Abhishek Rula is saying, please tell us about therapy techniques. It can't be done in a one day session. I would do workshops and uh, let me know. You can send me an email and I will keep you informed for sure. How to manage the um, behavior of difficult to adapt to change during this lockdown period. I mean, those are the activities, like I said, you know, uh, the figure of eight, you could do that and make it fun and dance. That is really, really, really very good. Um, then um, Mita has asked, I have not heard properly, but do we need to allow stimming toys like cars? Um, I don't think the toy per se is stimming. It is if the child is stimming with that particular toy. Um, and if it is very hard and if it's coming in the way, because there are ways in which you can um, address that. But if it is really very hard and you don't know what the techniques are, then I would say keep it out of the child's visual field, you know, because if they come into your therapy room and they see it, then you're going to waste half an hour just having a past struggle with them and taking it away. So don't give it to them. There is a way in which you can do it, but, you know, you need to know these techniques really very well. Why are autism kids having sleep disturbances? I just, you know, explained that that's part of their diagnosis and it's part of it. What can we do about it? There are lots of things that we can do about it. Again, like small things like, you know, making sure before they go to bed is that there is a routine and the parents have to stick to that routine, not keep changing the timing uh, of when the child is going to bed. Um, giving them, you know, a bath and sort of giving them a massage before going to bed would help a lot. So that's just, you know, saying something really very short. Um, will we get a recording uploaded somewhere? Yes, you will. Will when there are uh, when they are at their teenage 
they have food craving, how to tackle. <laughs> like they have the same problems that all teenagers have at puberty. So, um, you know, I you can always, um, that's not my area of expertise. You know, if they're eating too much, just give it to them and make sure that they have a lot of physical activity. It becomes a problem if they're eating too much and they don't have physical activity. So saying no to a child in terms of food, I find personally as one of the most difficult things. And um, the way I would counteract that is giving them a lot of physical activity because whatever energy you're consuming, you want to expend it. So if they're eating too much, but it's, you know, it's the parents' responsibility not to keep food that, you know, is very fattening. So ice cream, sodas, cookies, all that is, you know, if you're keeping it at home and if you're eating it or somebody at home is eating that, then you can't tell your child don't eat and you eat it or somebody else in the house eats it. So it's best not to have these uh, foods in the house. Um, and it is possible, you know, I've raised two children and when they were growing, there were no sodas in the house, no cookies. I must have, you know, but they enjoyed. I kept fruits in the lower shelves of the fridge and if they wanted it, they could open and eat and there were no sodas. Um, and I made the juices. <laughs> so um, I just believe in that. So, you know, that's one of the things, that's the only thing I can tell you. Then, um, Ma'am, what can be done if a child shows continuous shouting and laughing in his behavior? All what I told you today, everything, if you can, uh, if you're a parent and you're asking, um, the 30 minutes of physical activity, everything that you learned about physical activity would help. And I would love to hear from you if it made a difference or not. Um, thank you for your time. My son, um, my son is a tour worker. Should I be worried? How can it affect him? He is otherwise a happy, healthy, spirited child and even athletic. And he does exercises and oh my goodness, this is like, yeah, you don't have to be worried. Um, but let the therapist, you know, uh, sort of monitor what's going on. And you, if, you know, that's a very small concern. I don't know if you said that he is on the spectrum. But um, if that's the only concern, you want to make sure that, um, you know, he doesn't develop tightness in his muscles so you can uh, find out from a therapist what type of stretching it is. Um, and sometimes if it's only toe walking, it's also connected with their vision. So you could get their eyesight checked. I have seen I have seen one or two kids where, you know, they were walking on their toes. We got their eyesight checked. They got glasses and didn't have to tell them anything. They were walking you know, getting the heels down. So that's another thing to check. But a lot of times toe walking is an indication that there is some other sensory issues and things like that. So you need to um, get your child assessed by a therapist who is familiar with sensory motor development and, you know, just go for regular checkups. Maybe we miss something the first time, but go for regular checkups. But if that's the only concern, I would say, you know, Oh, that's really great. Can you please throw some light on what kind of calming activities we can give an anxious kid? The breathing is really very good. And, you know, telling them to just uh, anything that's proprioceptive. I don't know if you're a parent or um, or a therapist, but, um, you know, for calming, I would say, you know, your child is really upset. Putting pressure, compression is really very good. So. It's, you know, on the front and behind over here and press for about three, four seconds and relax. Or you can also just hold it. You have to play with it with your child and then do side to side. You can do that and then give them a lot of, you know, like deep massage, like you're pressing down on their hands like that. So it is compression. You're doing that. You can um, do it for the entire body. And um, the other thing that you can also do is for calming is you know, tell, drink water, let them drink water. There are lots of different things um, and, you know, that you can do for calming. Like I said, that is a course in itself, but um, doing massage is really very good and uh, what we call as heavy work, you know. So I don't know how old, you say how old your child is? Um, you know, heavy work activities. You can just Google it and see what is heavy work. That'll give you a lot of ideas. Um, 
ma'am, they do say that Maida and wheat products increases hyperactivity. How does it have an impact? Well, you know, food definitely is not my area of expertise, but from what I know about uh, wheat is um, they say it does have an effect. And the best way to know whether it's true or not is, you know, give your child the wheat products, see what effect it has on its symptoms, and then take it away and for a week or so and see if there's any improvement in the symptoms. And if you find an improvement, you know your answer, you have your answer. Um, Ma'am, what can we do to increase attention span for these kids? You have my answer. The exercise is really very good. What is CDC? I'm sorry, it's the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, it's here in Atlanta in the US. So um, you can Google that and it's Centers for Disease Control. Is there any possibility that the affected children can harm themselves like involving in risky actions? I mean, it really depends on what the functional level of your child is. And do they engage in self-aggression? That's aggression towards themselves. Yes, 100%. If, you know, people, I, I find that as a child, um, you know, feels this frustration that people don't understand him. I have seen it in a um, four-year-old who came in, I used to call him my little Buddha. He was such a happy kid. But by the end of his second year in school, he was biting other kids and biting himself too. And that's just because I feel uh, we could not address his needs. This was right in the beginning when I first started with therapy, you know, um, on my journey with autism spectrum. And I didn't know how to help the teacher too well. So I've come a long way from there, but when we don't understand them and we have all these expectations, um, especially I would say with the stimming behaviors, you know, we keep telling them to stop it, which only gets them more anxious and uh, leads to all these type of behaviors. And there's lots to it with behavior. I can't really talk about it now, but um, they can do it if they don't understand what the consequences is. So if it's a child who is nonverbal, they can engage in a lot of risky behavior because they don't understand it. And there are ways in which we can work around that. Um, Hello, ma'am. Can you give any links for articles that can be referred to? Sure, I can give you a lot of links. Please send me an email and we can do that. How is the neuroplasticity in ASD? Does it have any age limit? No, it does not have any age limit. Neuroplasticity is the same principle for everybody who's typical and atypical. The more you do one particular thing, it gets embedded more. It goes with anything your thought process, you think about something a lot, it gets embedded. You do movements, this, you know, the same type of movements that gets embedded. So neuroplasticity is, um, you know, a property that's valid for everyone. And we're making use of it in uh, children on the spectrum. Parents these days are more focusing on homeopathy medicines. It has been helpful for some while, uh, not for some, is it recommended? See, I'm not going to say anything about, um, you know, plus points or negative points of homeopathy or anything else, uh, only because I don't know much about it. I don't know if it had an effect on your child's symptoms. But the only thing that I would caution is just make sure it doesn't have any negative effects. And before going, reaching for all these other things, you know, what I call the pill, uh, why don't you give physical activity um, opportunity? and see if you're going to be getting the results and reducing the symptoms that you want to reduce. It is a lot of work, but I have parents who say, I'll do anything for my child. You know, I'll walk on hot coals. Um, so I would say, incorporate this. It is evidence-based, it, it is work. And, um, you know, make your child in, try and get, the goal should also be that your child should do it independently. So initially, we start off with a lot of support and everyone doing it. But as a child grows, I can give you a written guarantee that they want to do it by themselves. You know, um, I have seen this. I'm, the reason I'm saying all this is because I've seen when, when your child experiences what happens within their body, you know, um, they don't even have to cognitively think about it. They're going to seek it out. 
And to give you an idea is, you know, children usually when we in the uh, school, you know, going to the classroom to take these kids out from the class and coming with us, coming with me for therapy. They, I'm, I'm talking about this, this was a classroom where they were very, very involved. You know, all of them were nonverbal. But after the first month, every time I entered that classroom, they would turn to look at me and all of them very expectantly, like, are you going to take me now? Because they're not thinking of it in a cognitive level. And it's nothing to really do with me too. It is because I'm giving their body an opportunity. I've given, I've allowed their body to understand what feels good for them. And they like that. So that's why they want to come with me. So that's what I'm saying. Let them experience it in their body and they will want to do it. You don't have to motivate them and everything. All that is taken care of if they reach that level of doing 20 to 30 minutes of hard breathing when they're doing the exercises. Um, how to reduce parents these days are how to reduce toe walking in moderate to severe ASD kids. If they are moderate to severe, I would say work on all the other things, the cognitive, the organization, the calming and all that. Don't worry about the toe walking. Those things you can worry about after addressing that. Um, how can we learn from her? Is there a possibility of having online classes with her? Yes, definitely. I would do that. Please email me and I will keep you in the list. What are the best physical exercise? Wait, what are the best physical exercises for autistic kids at home during this curfew? I answer then. We can ignore a child if they are fidgeting. We can ignore a child if they are fidgeting while sitting, but what if they are roaming around the class? Very, 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 very good question. So we have different, we call it alternate seating um, solutions. So, you know, they could be sitting on a big therapy ball and when they're sitting on a big therapy ball, they are um, what we call it as classroom friendly strategy because they're not disturbing anybody and they're getting the movement that they want. And some teachers were very, very creative and they actually uh, reached out to the PTO and they got therapy balls for everybody to sit on. So the child won't feel like they are the only child sitting on that. But again, it depends on the need of the child. If that doesn't satisfy the child, then there are something called standing desks. So, you know, they can be at the, at the back of the class and they could be standing. And if they want to walk a little bit, you know, they do it. We need to accommodate it, you know, telling them not to walk around, not to, um, sh not to be fidgety. It just comes in the way of their ability to process information that's been given to them. Is it safe to teach traveling independence in moderate to severe kids with ASD? Independence, um, you know, the amount of independence would be, um, you know, would be right, but completely independent if they're moderate to severe, my personal experience would be no, but there are, uh, you, you know, this uh, Dr. Bhakti, um, definitely get in touch with me there are gps systems that the child could wear and which would alert people if they have you know moved away from a place where they should be so um during covid the company is actually giving it free to parents so please get in touch with me and i can give you information about that or you can go to my website um i have information on that on my facebook page playground to learn there is information about that um, on that page. My daughter is 14 years old uh, and she's taking some medication. She's hyperactive, gets angry. We, I've answered that. Is there any exercise prescription? Of course, there's exercise prescription, but it's very customized and detailed. It's not one thing fits all. Um, what is your comment on regular education on the children with moderate and severe disability level in mainstream classrooms? It really depends on the needs. The first thing is we have something called uh, LRE that is least restrictive environment, but it should be conducive for your child and for the other children too. And um, if your child is unable to learn in the general ed environment, even after all the accommodations and everything is in place, 
then um, the gender-led classroom is really not the place for your child. There's a lot of consideration that goes into it, but um, do we want children to be with in the gender-led? Yes, we do, but um, there are lots of factors that go into deciding the placement of the child. Um, what physical activity can be designed in between speech therapy session? I'm sorry, I don't understand that question. I am sure if you have shared the techniques you applied with the kids, I may have missed it, but share those once again. Well, today was just more about sharing the techniques would take, you know, two days, three days. In this one hour presentation, it's more the objective of this one hour presentation was to increase awareness of an evidence based intervention. And that's pretty powerful stuff in terms of you know knowing that exercise has such a huge impact on nearly all the symptoms but it has to be taken in the right frequency intensity and things like that and to learn the specific techniques for therapists you know that would be an online um, workshop in itself what are the exercises that help kids on the spectrum everything you know it has to be each child is different but proprioceptive vestibular all good activities um hello thank you for the session my son is very good in math but when it comes to interpreting the text he feels a little difficult his mother sits with him and explains in a very detailed manner with the example sometimes he doesn't like to listen too much of explanation sometimes when we play games he's interested in the end result and how he is playing I mean, there's a lot that can be done for your child, a lot, you know, and the physical activity is good. There's something called play attention, which is a neurocognitive training program that would be really, very good for your child. Uh, if reading is an issue, just check and see whether he can skip. And uh, I would love it if you could, um, you know, send me an email and I can talk to you more about that. My son, Keshav, appears to be a mild, autistic he is very impulsive i've given all those answers are there any specific exercises or any other activities uh i have answered that please list the exercises there is i i'm actually going to talk about this you know there's no question I'm, in fact i really feel very bad when therapists give a list of activities to the teachers and say you can do this as calming the teacher doesn't have time to look at that list and um, the best way is, you know, the therapists ourselves, we should see which are the activities, right? because I have seen therapists saying, you know, walking on hands, do this, do that, but they actually have not done it with the child. So as therapists, I feel we should find out which is the strategy from all the organizing strategies that we know of. We need to do it ourselves and we need to see what effect it has on the child. So, and then go and tell the teacher that because there's a lot involved. Giving a list is something that I really don't um, endorse. But if the list is something that you have tried and you know for a fact that works for that particular child, yes. And it shouldn't be more than, you know, like three or four for each, like for calming, for organizing and things like that. Can we have a copy of the PPT presentation at the end? And does it list? the references. No, I have not listed the references, but you can have the PPT presentation. You can get in touch with Autism Connect and it will uh, give you a recording. Uh, just Dr. Bala refers to about the connection between physical activities and academic skills. That's very interesting. Thank you. And, you know, get in touch with me privately on my email and I can give you all the references for that too. My pleasure sharing this information. If we all can get together and help children on the spectrum, you know, it'll be absolutely fantastic. Um, thanks so much for the great presentation. As a speech therapist working with children on the spectrum, can one include exercise in the therapy sessions? Yes, 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 yes. I have worked with speech therapists and we've got good results together. Or counsel uh, parents to hire a physical therapists to do it. Yes, I would only caution that we need to know that therapists because the approach for children on the spectrum is a sensory motor development they should know the neuro prepping activities and things like that i wouldn't want a parent to you know get discouraged if the pt um 
cannot help your child only because like i said you know a parent a teacher a therapist anyone working with kids on the spectrum should know what their symptoms are how it impacts um whatever we do with them regularly so that's really very important that you go to someone who's worked with children on the spectrum but you know i do long distance consulting so you can reach out to me too what is tai chi she is left but it is like yoga in motion um how many exercises is a good amount till they start sweating should we introduce new few exercises through the day if you are a mother i would say if you're a parent i would say no just concentrate on getting the heart rate up with whatever they're doing if a parent is hyper how will he exercise excellent excellent question excellent question abhishek abhishek asked it a lot of times parents tell me i don't have to work on you know any physical activity my child is running around a lot and um, the reason that they're running around so much is because they're trying to stimulate those parts of the brain um, to wake up and when we give them medication we are actually giving them calming uh, medications. Uh, I mean, uh, we are not giving them calming, we're giving them actually stimulatory medications um, because we want, we want the brain to release those chemicals, neurochemicals that is released by exercise. We want the medicines to be doing the same thing. So you really want to go to a therapist who can tell you what can be done for your child he is moving and because he's trying to give his body what it needs but we need to look at his complete system neurological system and come up with an exercise program for him um and let him run if nothing else if you don't know anybody let him run as much as he can but get in touch with me and i can tell you what else you can do like i was talking about work smartly is you know you can put a weighted vest on him when he's doing it listen to music at the same time you could have music going on so that is called pairing of uh, sensory systems and you want to do that uh, but don't try it on your own you know send me an email and i can walk you through it because you need to do an assessment before you start doing these things um I think I got the answer with the slide. Okay. Um, are there any contradictions to a specific exercise if a child has comorbidity? Yeah, if he has epilepsy, then you don't want to give the strobe lights, you know, the flashing black and white lights. You don't want that. And whenever you're doing vestibular, vestibular is uh, activities which involves a lot of like rotation and the feet is off the ground. So you don't want to do that if you don't know what to expect. Um, because you can cause a lot of distress to the child. I understand these exercises would require a lot of imitation of command following skills and the please guide how to improve these skills in a three and four year old with all the visual cues and props. I think exercise with music like aerobics is better for PWD children. ASD, I guess you meant. Um, and yes, 100%. Can we get the copy of the presentation? Yes. Is it possible? Can you have a separate webinar? Yes. My daughter is a four year old and she's not motivated for any physical play at all. Um, so, all those prepping activities that I spoke about, the social stories and things like that, and you can email me and I can walk you through that. That is very, very difficult, but you know, things that I mentioned in this presentation should also help. Ma'am, could you please comment about swimming? It's absolutely fantastic. If you can get your job, thank you so much for this question. Swimming is very, very, very good. Um, I had a parent who, you know, had twins and she used to um one kid was on the autism spectrum and she started taking him for uh, swimming and then she got pregnant and so then she let me know and she said when the baby was going to be delivered she said bala i can't take him for swimming it's a little bit too much and then she sent me a note and she said oh my god i better take him because all his symptoms have come back everything that we thought was under control and we, the only difference is he's not going for swimming she got him back to swimming and everything went back to you know where it was before so swimming is really very good 
Uh, I gave you all the frequency of regular exercise. It is every day. I spoke about all that in depth. And um, can we go for pool activities 100%? Anything that your child likes. If your child likes water, make the most of pool activities. There's so much you can do. Ma'am, except amygdala changes, what are all the other neuroanatomical changes? Um, there are lots. There are lots and lots of them. That's another uh, presentation workshop. Uh, what activities can you suggest to calm these kids? I already said that. Um, is repetitive blinking a type of repetitive behavior? Um, I have not seen it, but I would say, you know, if your child has a history of seizures, uh, check it out if your child is not getting um, petit mal seizures. So just get that checked out how to provide contingency in doing treadmill you can do a lot of things you have to get in touch with me for that i can walk you through it that's great if your child likes to go on the treadmill you can do a lot a lot with it um can we get a template of exercises that help kids on the spectrum um i mean i can talk about just general general activities for sure um, and we could, that's another, you know, it's another workshop. Um, wonderful presentation, thank you. My question is, at what age does one begin to notice that a child is autistic? Um, and how can one help, especially at the early stage, considering that toddlers um, cannot be given exercises? Oh my God, there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot. So go to the CDC website and it will give you the autism tracking thing that will, you know, so we can um, start intervention as soon as possible. It used to be three years where we first realized the child was autistic. Now it's come down to around 18 months. You know, there are times when you can uh, diagnose a lot earlier, especially if there is another sibling who has, uh, who's on the spectrum. And the earlier the intervention, the better. But what I always tell my parents is that um, start the interventions. You know, if you have, if your doctors are not giving the diagnosis and you um, have a feeling, especially if you have the tracking app, uh, because all these things, whatever um, OT or PT and a speech does, none of them is bad for your child. So if it turns out that um, your child doesn't have autism, you know, it's fine you know we've not harmed your child but uh sometimes you know and it is mild there i didn't get a chance to tell you that there was a kid who i was seeing at three years and by the time he was five he did not even qualify to be under the autistic spectrum that's not to say that that's a cure it's just that we knew how to understand his triggers and how to get all those symptoms down to the minimum so um, we can do a lot. Um, my son is age six years and has ASD. He has lots of sensory issues, nonverbal, very much hyperactive, and his attention span is very, very short. So all the things that I said, first do that and you know, do it for a um, month and then get back to me and tell me, you know, and I can walk you through what needs to be done. Um, the frequency picture was not clear. The frequency, as I said, everyone on the spectrum, what, however functioning they are, if they're very involved or very minimally involved, need exercise every day for 60 minutes. That's the ideal. Um, you know, but 20 to 30 minutes also will give you those therapeutic benefits. And it has to be done every day. So that's very, very important. Um, and then if the symptoms still like concentration and focus and all, then you add all those other activities, um, you know, like the yoga and um, the team sports and things like that. Uh, hello, I got to know about the webinar a few minutes ago. I miss the major part of it. Yeah, it can be, um, you know, get in touch with Autism Connect and they will send you a recording. Can you enlist the daily activities using daily objects to help kids for ASD for the exercise routine since it's complete? 
um, you know, having such specifics, you're not going to learn it within an hour. And uh, that would be an online workshop. But send in your request. If there are many people requesting it, then I'll definitely, um, you know, plan out a workshop and let you all know about it. Always putting the tongue out and touching his hand should we ask him to stop this behavior. If you ask him to stop the behavior, I'm giving you written guarantee that it's going to become more. But do all these other things and um, it's going to have an impact on this. Um, because he's craving a sensation. He's doing it in a way that he knows best. But when you make him do the exercises, then he's automatically getting those sensations. So he won't have a need to do it this way. Okay, I hope that helps you. Um, are ABA therapists trained to do this? I don't know, do what the exercises? I mean, I don't understand exactly what the question. In Nigeria, many of the parents of children on the spectrum believe and work with them. What is your advice? I don't understand the question, but I can tell you this, that you know, communities of the um, Orthodox Jewish communities over here in the United States, we see less of the symptoms in that community because they really, um, believe in getting the children to do a lot of heavy work like doing household things working out in the farm and so they're doing a lot of physical activity and physical activity is very very good for organizing and calming the brain so um if that's what your question is yes physical activity is really very very good um can I get contact details? Yes, it is there on, you can get in touch with Autism Connect if you don't have a copy of this presentation and um, you can get my contact information. My daughter has Asperger's, she has a lot of anxiety. So that in itself, the exercises should help a lot. Um, she's not able to perform her daily chores and unable to sleep too. She is presently on medication, I also, take her to walk every day for 30 minutes, but that has not really helped. Good question. You take her for a walk, but that doesn't help for 30 minutes. Is she breathing hard? So you can, you know, take music in your phone and you can say, okay, let's run for two, three minutes and then stop and then run. So do it with her, try and get her heart rate up. And for her, if 30 minutes, I don't know if she was panting or not, you can easily increase it to 60 minutes. She needs it more. You know, so that means the intensity has to be more for her. Um, could you please advise which is the best exercise for her? Like, again, I would say when you're doing the walking with her, make her do a lot of arm exercises, you know, take songs that will tell her what to do, you know. Um, so you can do that and also tell her to jump as she's walking for about 10 steps and then stop and then march and tell her, you know, to move her hands like that. All that will make her pant. The whole point is you want her to pant. Um, only then you're going to get the therapeutic benefits. And 30 minutes, like I said, they have said for children, you need 60 minutes. But parents just feel so overwhelmed when I tell them 60 minutes that when I found research articles that said 20 to 30, I'm like, stick, I, you know, recommend 20 to 30. But 60 minutes is, you know, you, you maybe you, that's what you have to do. Can you send some resources to help Spectrum kids? you can get in touch with me i'll definitely give you that uh what is the name of the program you mentioned for asd and treadmill it's called tap t a a p it is um autism uh it's an autism program for i forget the whole um, thing it's called t is treadmill training for autism um AP for praxis and something else but it's if you you can google it it's t a p p uh, most of the parents prefer individual therapy sessions can you share your experience on group therapy uh, like i said the individual sessions is good but it's not going to get the results a team effort is very very necessary i think i showcased that really well in my uh, presentation could you please explain me moves Mm, you can get in touch with me or you can, you know, so I, I can definitely talk to you about that. I'm interested in brain gym, show classroom movements once again. 
how to reduce the repetitive behaviors like hand flapping. Um, if you do the exercises and the required intensity, it's going to come down. What is your comment on brain gym, which is by, widely considered a pseudoscience and at the same time we recommend it as an intervention strategy? I wouldn't say that I'm in saying that it is an um, intervention strategy by itself. And like everything, I would say, what's the meaning of evidence-based? Evidence-based is that it has um, research, it has some evidence that it has worked on kids, but something that has worked on one child may not work on another child. So if for whatever reason it's not working with your child, then you don't use that. But I have found tremendous, tremendous um, improvements with incorporating brain gym into my practice. And, um, you know, it's really very good. I'm going to tell you one very simple activity, which is very powerful. It is a sleeping figure of eight. And this is how you go. You can get your child to do this. You can uh, have it on laminated on a you know on a legal paper eight by eight and you get them to trace it or whatever it's a really good activity but i would say explore brain gym i find it extremely extremely effective and if it doesn't work it doesn't work but i've not yet found anyone where on whom it doesn't work you should know what to do you can't just very blindly go and give any activity and tell them to do it um how to treat a child if there's cognitive perceptual pro problems along with ASD. Um, you know, that's a topic in itself. Um, how effective is AAC? Of course, it's extremely effective. It gives a child, AAC is augmentative um, communication devices. So um, you, it's very effective. Of course, it should be the right one. It's always each thing, choosing the intervention and what thought process and decision-making skills go in choosing it, they could give you an augmentative um, device which is not appropriate for your child. You know, so the assessment is really very important. A child with autism along with sensory problems uh, of hearing and vision often mind them isolated. How can we engage them with these strategies? I think I've already spoken about that. Um, can we bring awareness among clinicians about the role of pediatric? I mean, I really, you know, call me and I'll do a lot with that. So, Jahir Abbas, yes, please get in touch with me. And if you know there are therapists who are really, really interested, I am willing to do online courses. You know, this is my passion. I feel as physical therapists, we have so much to offer. We just don't know how to do it. And, you know, the basic training is there but sort of uh, customizing it for autism requires you know a few a course at least one course in it and i'm willing to do that if a child doesn't have good cognition then how to use the timer oh it's a lot of work it is a lot of work nupur chopra and but as long as we identify that the child needs a timer so this is coordination between the speech therapist the teacher you know, and you as the PT, I don't know if you're the PT, but it's a lot of work, but it needs to be, you know, thought. So maybe it won't take a day and maybe it may take two years, but it is something worth teaching and having as a goal. Ma'am, I'm a special mom and doing sports activities with special children. Can we have your email ID? Yes, please get in touch. I would love, love to be in connected with you. So get in touch with Autism uh, Connect. What kind of physical ex activities are suitable for four to five year olds? Get in touch with me and we can do consultations. The lots and lots and lots. Um, we started with writing diary to do list and the trick and the things and the things he needs to do. What can be the next thing we can do? A schedule. Get in touch with me and I will tell you what we can do. Can you share the book list again? Um, you know, if it's not clear, then you can get in touch with me and I will send you the book list. Um, can you, and in case, I don't want you all to feel that, oh, you don't have a book list. Just look for social stories. You Google it and you're going to get a lot. Google social stories. Can you share the slide of the books on movement once again? 
I just want to let you know that I couldn't see these questions uh, the way this is set up. I can only see it at the end. Um, so, you know, I'm sorry, I couldn't see it then. But, you know, get in touch with me and I will give you whatever information you want. So he's 16 years old, recently started a little back and forth movement in COVID time. So that's an indication that he is stressed out, you know, so give him a little bit more attention, do all these physical activities at home and um, let me know, you know, try that and get in touch with me and let me know how to improve their sleep. I touched based on that when we were talking. Um, will we get a certificate? No. <laughs> This was just an awareness thing. How many hours of sleep is recommended? I mean, I'm again not the expert, but I think children need at least eight hours. Um, please, could you share your slide on the books? Wow, everybody liked the books a lot. So yes, get in touch with me and we can do that. Or like I said, Google it. Best exercise for speech development. It's I used to have the kids on the ball as a speech therapist who was working on speech and I did a lot of things on the therapy ball. I would say any movement, but again, if you find that one particular movement does better with the kid, then do it. And the best way to find out is with the speech therapist. Um, you don't have to do all your sessions together, but just to, you know, she can see what you're doing, you can see what she's doing and this way both benefit from each other. My son is 3.4. Can we start with treadmill exercises? Yes. But it has to be from someone who knows how to do it. So, you know, the lady who came up with this protocol, I actually know her personally. And um, she has done it with very involved children on the autism spectrum. And she's got all of them very independent, you know, the very, very involved children teaching a lot of concepts on the treadmill program. So uh, please, you know, Google that, T-A-A-P, Deborah Widmeyer, that's the person who actually came up with this program. And uh, thank you, ma'am, really love the presentation. Thank you, thank you. Very, very informative, thank you. Please suggest some physical activities for older kids at home. I will. You can, Neha Sharma, you can get in touch with me. Um, can you share the slide on the classroom movement activities? I mean, that is, you know, just to give you an idea, it's not so much to give you an idea of the classroom movement activities, but I was showing that more that you need a chart up there so the child can see what is expected. Um, all these things can be covered in an online workshop. Thanks so much. It was very informative and useful. Thank you. It was a very nice PowerPoint. Thank you. Excellent presentation, great, thank you. <laughs> a lot of good take home lessons, thank you. Brilliant, thank you, thank you so much. I'm very happy, thank you so much. This inspires me to do this more, I'm so happy. Please tell us about hyperactivity and how to do the exercises. I, like I said, attend the course. And if the child is not comfortable with the activity you give them, shall we skip that activity? Yes, unless you're a physical therapist and you know how to get that a motor skill to emerge. I always say the difficult things a therapist does, the easy things, you should never give anything that's not easy to teachers and parents. Um, so they should never, never do anything that's uncomfortable unless you have told them techniques on what to do. Is there any particular physical activity to reduce self giggling in teens with autism? I'm gonna say, let them laugh. <laughs> Why not? And um, some more games at home. Um, if you can explain uh, any links that you can suggest. I'm really happy with all the questions, but I don't know if I'm going too much over time. Um, I know Autism Connect told me that I could go on. So if anyone is leaving, leave. But if you want me to 